we need to keep ourselves buoyant and buoyed up as well as understanding what's going on and try to mitigate that. And I think that's a real balance that we're all in right now. So when you say, what do you think is a good life? For me, right now, because that's all I have, right now, it's finding that balance, that expressing the joys that I have and the griefs that I have, helping however I can to bring the temperature of the world down, which might be just my world, and being able to celebrate and bring joy, not just to me, but also to the world. You're listening to A New Way of Living with Dan Voss, inspiring you to a new life of breathwork, cold therapy, and plant medicine. In this week's episode, my guest is Lauren Walker. Lauren has been teaching yoga and meditation for the past 25 years and created Energy Medicine Yoga while teaching at Norwich University, the oldest private military college in the country. She now teaches EM yoga across the U.S. and internationally. Her two previous books, The Energy Medicine Yoga Prescription and Energy Medicine Yoga, Amplify the Healing Power of Your Yoga Practice, both won Nautilus Silver Award for Best Mind-Body Publication. In 2016, she was named one of the top 100 most influential yoga teachers in America, and she has a new book out, The Energy to Heal. Lauren, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. It's nice to be with you. Yeah, I'm excited for our conversation today around, of course, yoga um, and other practices like meditation and the idea of mindfulness and how we can bring energy into our lifestyles and how it plays into our health. So with that being said, I would love to start a conversation around um, what is energy medicine yoga and how did you create it and start it? So I had been practicing traditional yoga for um, probably, let's see, a little over a decade, uh, not quite a decade, um, when I discovered the work of Donna Eden. So I had been studying and teaching yoga, and it was an incredible experience. I loved it the minute I started practicing and dove deep, took a training right away, started teaching right away, more trainings, 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 trainings. Um, but it, No matter how much I learned, I wasn't getting to the crux of my own issues. I wasn't able to resolve what I was struggling with in life. And at that time, I had had several sort of um, traumatic events and experiences. And I want to qualify what I mean by trauma. It's an event that happens that knocks you off of the pathway that you had been going on and makes going back to that pathway uh, almost impossible. Whether it's a, a, a thought, a a mental, physical, emotional, spiritual event that happens that knocks you off. And I was knocked really hard. And none of the yoga practices that I was doing was able to do anything but kind of keep me at, um, able to go forward, like just, you know, your nose just above the water. And then within the span of a month, two different people in two different countries told me about Donna Eden. So I took that little you know, whispering from the universe. And I went and sought out her work. And it was transformational. What I learned from her over the next, and continuing to learn from her. So I started studying with her in 2003. So we're almost, is it almost 20 years of studying with Donna Eden? Um, And it is profound how she influenced my own personal practice. And then really, the creation, I call her the grandmother of energy medicine yoga, because it wouldn't have happened had I not met her and had this, um, it was an immediate epiphany and then a long awakening of understanding what energy really is, what medicine really is, what energy medicine is, and then taking that rich depth of understanding and practice and weaving it into a 5,000 year old tradition of yoga, creating something totally new and overcoming all of the resistance that you might think comes from that doing. And here we are today, three books later and a worldwide um, awakening to the power that we all hold within. It's fascinating. 
How would you describe or consider energy to be medicine? You know, there's so many different um, methods and ideas of what medicine can be. How would you consider energy to be a form of medicine? So it's used in even traditional Western medicine um, and practices all the time. If you go to get your kidney stones um, removed, what they will do is pulse um, very uh, uh, tones into your kidney stones to break them apart. Um, if you get an EKG measuring your heart or measuring your brain, what electrical impulses they're putting off, you are studying that by the energy that the heart or the brain is putting out. So um, energy is used in healing modalities and has been for years, even if we're not necessarily calling it that. And then there's other very simple things that we use personally that we might not have thought about as being energy and being a, a healing or medicinal value. Things that are very simple, like, you know, you slam your elbow on the door as you're going through and you just stop and you rub your elbow really strongly, right? You're massaging the elbow. You are actually using energy medicine. You are bringing more coherence to that area that you just jammed and it feels better. It feels different. When you rub your belly if you have a stomach ache or you rub your temples if you have a headache, all of these things are working with our energy. But since we never really learned what energy was, we have two definitions. We have the physics definition. Energy is the uh, capacity to do work. And then we have the sort of social um, idea explanation of it. Either you have a lot of energy and you're really going on shooting on all cylinders, you might say, or you have no energy and you're tired and you're dragging. And, you know, so that's what we think about when we think about energy. And then we think about it in terms of political, we think about energy independence and we think about, you know, gas and oil, or we think about wind and solar. Those are the ways we think about energy, but we don't discuss it yet at its root level, which is where we talk about it in energy medicine yoga. And that is that energy is all there is. That's it. We are all energy. We are all vibrating bits of information, light and sound. And if we had learned the truth of that, which science, modern Western science confirms that to be the case, but we don't really learn that. If we learned that in school, alongside math and writing and all of those other things in our science classes, we would have such a different experience and relationship with what the essence of us is made up of. And we would have an easier way of working with the issues that come up in our lives. Yeah. So uh, when it comes to traditional yoga, how would you describe energy medicine yoga in terms of some differences that people might experience if they're used to traditional yoga? What are some things that are coming into play um, as it relates to, to energy medicine yoga? So in an energy medicine yoga class, a lot of it will look very similar to a traditional yoga class. And then there will be some things that will look a little bit different and you're like, okay, that's a little deviation on theme, but I'm still with you. We're still in the same wheelhouse. And then some things will be wildly different and some things you will never have seen at all. And so the techniques and the tools that we use are primarily the body to get in touch with the energy systems that underlie the body which is why it's so powerful to do that in a yoga practice. So there are poses, there are very specific poses that open flows of energy. And then we assist that with movements of the hands over the physical body or in the fields around the body. We'll use different massage techniques and different points. We'll use acup acupressure points, which are the same as the acupuncture points, but you use your hands to stimulate them instead of a needle. Um, we'll use wider um, holds on the body to again speak to very specific flows and patterns of energy in the body. So when I originally studied traditional yoga, we learned about energy, but in this very diffuse and esoteric way. It was like prana. If you've ever studied yoga, you may have heard the word prana, which is one of its meaning is energy. 
and it's the subtle energies that run everything and the you know it's the energy that you feel when you're moving but it's very subtle and it's very diffuse and sometimes you might feel it if you're doing a big opening pose a big hip opener or back opener or something heart opener but oftentimes you'll feel it maybe in shavasana after your whole practice and you're in rest pose and you might feel this kind of tingling sensation in different areas or all over your body and it's it's a lovely sensation, but it wasn't something that I felt like I could really anchor into or necessarily replicate, or I didn't really know what it was doing. Was it a specific thing or was it just a general feel good sensation? Could I call it up at any time? Could I utilize it for very specific things? In other words, could I laser point that prana and do something really specific with it? And the answers that I kept getting was no, there's no, I couldn't harness it. I couldn't direct it. When I started studying with Donna and started to understand that energy is not this esoteric, secret, hidden language that you have to study for you know your whole lifetime to understand if access to, you can only access it if you're at this certain level or if you're a, a guru or a teacher of some high report or all of that. That's not what energy is at all. It is this very accessible force that is all over your body, on the physical layers, on the surface of interior. It surrounds your body. You can feel it. You can move it. You can do very specific things with it. It's easy to work with. It's illuminating, and it is incredibly empowering because all of a sudden, here's the secret thing that's been hidden and you know, and talked about, it's the most powerful thing, but only a few people have access to it. And all of a sudden it's like, actually, this is your birthright. Everyone has access to it. There's really easy ways to access it. Anyone can do it. You don't have to be skinny. You don't have to be flexible. You don't have to have a cute yoga outfit. Anyone can do it anywhere, anytime. The results are profound. And here I want to show you how to do it. So that's what these three books are is Here's the techniques. They're really, really easy and incredibly powerful. Try them out. And what we've found over these years and hundreds and hundreds and thousands of students and teachers around the world is, is replicable. It is transferable to any person. Anyone can do it. And the results continue hmm. to blow my mind. Yeah. A lot of what you're describing here reminds me of why I love breathwork so much is that anybody can do it. You can use it at any time throughout your day, regardless of where you're at, whether you're sitting on a train or you're at home or you're in your office. Um, you know, it's something that we have as an innate part of us, right? We're talking about energy and yoga um, and our breath. Like these are things that make up the human being. And that's what's so cool about it is that it's, it's it's for anyone and everyone and we all have it and it's just about tapping into it and accessing it. Yeah, absolutely. So I definitely see a lot of crossover there. Yeah. yeah. How do you use, do you use breath much in, in this when it comes to energy medicine, yoga? Like how does our breath play into all this? Absolutely. The breath is a huge part of it. There are particular ways that we breathe doing um, certain techniques um, that are different from a traditional yoga breathing practice. And then we do do a lot of pranayama practices, which are um, breathing practices from the yoga tradition. We also do utilize different sounds that actually are very specific to activating certain organs in the body. Um, that comes from ancient Chinese medicine, and we use that quite a bit. And as you know from the breath work that you do and work with, your breath is, it's such a powerful and fascinating dynamic, as you know. It's one of the links between the conscious and the unconscious mind. It's one of the systems in the body that will run itself if you never think about it, and that you can also take over and run very specifically. And it is a corollary to your emotional state. So your emotional state is reflected mirror-like with your breath which means you can flip that the other way. So you can do breathing practices to create a specific emotional feeling or response, calm, joy, more energy, um, relieving grief. Like there are practices that you can do to bring into balance the emotional 
and the physical body. And, you know, what I love more and more about breathing practices, again, over the last decade or so, and I feel like it's going to happen even more moving into the future, Western science has been validating these ancient practices and techniques um, through studies, through um, data sets that are showing exactly what the ancients said was going to happen and describe practices. We do them today and science is saying, yeah, that is actually happening. You do have an aura. We're going to call it the biofield. The breath does have so much to do with stress. We're going to now cover that for insurance if you go to do meditation practices because it lowers your stress, which lowers your um, possibility of getting diseases. And so there's this beautiful synchronicity happening right now where the understanding of science is catching up to the wisdom of these ancient practices. And it's now being offered more and more into the mainstream as real tools with no side effects for working with some of the biggest challenges that people are facing today. And breath is a huge piece of it. And like you said, so accessible, so easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, you mentioned that emotional response element, um, and I know a big part of your work is around the five element theory or five E star. Um, can you share a little bit more about what that is? What is the five element theory and how does that play into everything we're talking about today? Mm -hmm. So we have nine energy systems that all interface and work together in our bodies, nine of them. And we've already actually mentioned a few of them. I talked about using acupressure points on the body, on the acupuncture meridian lines. So meridians is one of the systems in the body. That's also from ancient Chinese medicine. We talked about the aura or the biofield, as science calls it now, which is an incredibly uh, important part of your energy systems. And that comes more from, uh, from uh, the yoga studies from ancient India. And so one of the other systems is called five element theory. And that is also from ancient Chinese medicine. And five element theory is this massive theory that basically categorizes everything in the universe, everything into five distinct categories. So that is the stars, the planets, the earth, your body, the physical systems in your body, your organs, your um, cycles of life, your emotional experiences, the seasons, like it's this massive, comprehensive, huge, huge system of study. What's beautiful is it's massive, but it's also simple. Everything is only one of five things that really allows us to enter into this hugeness with a way that we can actually work with it in, in a, a smaller, more prescribed way. And one of the things that I love about five element theory, which is why I use it so much, is it includes the emotions. And I remember when I first started teaching energy medicine yoga and I was doing teacher trainings and I had maybe done 10 or 15 teacher trainings. And one of my um, students, who's now one of my senior teachers, had this incredible um, transformative, miraculous actually experience over those the four days of that teacher training. And one of the things that she wrote about when she wrote in to us to share that experience is energy medicine yoga is the first yoga practice that she had encountered that took into consideration our emotions. And I'd never thought about it so specifically before until she said that. And the more I thought about it, I was like, yeah, you know, that's true. I've had experiences in many yoga classes as a student and as a teacher where someone will have a breakdown or break open, right? They'll just start sobbing. And I thought, okay, well, that's interesting. And I sort of understood a little bit where that was coming from. But again, not until I really started to understand energy. But we are emotional beings. And to have a practice that honors that and gives you a place to process your emotions, to understand your emotions, or if you're someone that doesn't experience a lot of emotions, that um, you may... You may fear them or push them away or just never have had, you know, a lot of us have grown up in families where expressing your emotions wasn't really acceptable or encouraged. And so you might not even have an understanding or a language or an experience of the deep emotions that whether you're feeling them consciously or not are happening in the emotional body. And so you don't have to cry and 
you know, have this experience and anger and anxiety. All You don't have to feel them all, but you still have a practice in energy medicine yoga where you can release the energetic imprints of those emotional experiences without even going into the story of the emotion. It's sort of like a daily house cleaning for your emotional body. And then if you are someone that is very emotional and has an, uh, and feels that emotional response to everything, then you also have a way to work with your emotions. And emotions are so powerful. They give us information. They are they give us energy. It's kind of one of the the biggest energetic boosts to your life is your emotions. You think about it, it's like you what you feel influences you so hugely and we can talk about that more if you want to if you want to but th that that emotion to be able to process it to gather the information and then to release the energetic imprint is one of the hallmarks of em yoga and it really unprocessed emotion is one of the number one causes i'm going to go out on a limb and say it is the number one cause of stress in the body and stress is the number one cause of disease in the body so emotions unprocessed undealt with is the number one cause of disease in the body. So for me, this practice of working with your emotions is paramount if you want to heal. Yeah, absolutely. Gosh, you touched on so many great things there. And, and emotional health is such a big part of my work. So I'm, I'm deeply fascinated by this topic. And what you said there made so much sense around how unprocessed emotions, whether that's fear, anger, grief, anxiety, that leads to so many illnesses in our body. And it's not about um, suppressing these emotions, right? It's not about pushing away fear or anxiety. It's not like we're going to eliminate those things from our life altogether. We're human. They're going to come up. It's actually healthy to allow them to surface and, and deal with them in a healthy way. Um, otherwise, when you keep pushing them and suppressing them, that's where issues come up. So, um, yeah, it, it makes, it makes perfect sense with what you just shared there. Yeah. It's really, you know, it's a really beautiful part of the practice and really, I, I feel, you know, it's empowering to be able to own your own experience and make your own decisions and choices from your intrinsic truth and not be, you know, we all like say this, if we go see a movie or we watch something on social media or something, and we say, you know, that was so emotionally manipulative, right? When, when you see a movie and it pulls your heartstrings, right? That is the power of emotion. You can manipulate somebody with their emotions by creating an, uh, compounding an emotional response. And that is what art does. It, it's an emotional response. You go see a film or a play or an opera specifically to have an emotional response. That's why we go to these things, these events. And when we go to them together, we can have an emotionally cathartic response together, we can, which leads to healing, which leads to transformation, which leads to action, change. You know, how many times have you seen uh, a film or seen um, an and even an ad, and you've been like, I'm going to, to join that. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to help that event. I'm going to help that movement happen. I want to be part of that because I'm emotionally connected to that. Hmm. But the limitations and that I, I, I hate to say dangers, but I think I need to at this point because of what's going on in the world today, we can be so easily manipulated emotionally to then take action that maybe isn't really in line with our own inner truth, our own dharma, our own paths in life, our own spiritual paths in life. And so to be able to have tools to work with the emotions and then to release, you know, that wasn't my emotion. That was emotional manipulation. Mm. I, I don't actually agree with that or feel like that's the best path forward, best path forward for me. And so to be able to find your own inner core strength. And I'm not talking about six pack abs. I'm talking about your inner core truth, your North star that guides you is really important. And to be able to 
uh, work with your emotions so that you can release the ones that aren't serving you, gather the information, release the imprints of the energy and come more into your own truth, mm. I think is really, really key to all of us being able to move forward in the world today, which is so rife with emotional manipulation. Yeah. When you talk about things like finding your North Star and following that and paying attention to, you know, what emotions align with who we really are and which ones don't align with who we really are. How important is it to focus on self-awareness as that first step, right? Like for me, that's what I really paid attention to in my healing journey over these last couple of years. And self-discovery is like that self-awareness piece is so important to have as a foundational um, as, as your foundation, as your North star, right? It's like really learning about who you are and what you want out of this life. How important is that, um, to, to focus on that self-awareness piece as, as a foundation? I, I think it's huge. I mean, it's one of the tenets of yoga. Svadhyaya is self-study. It, it's incredibly important. I think one of the challenges, um, this is something that I teach in all of my teacher trainings, and it's always a challenge to figure out how best to teach this, because here's the thing with self-awareness. You can delude yourself into thinking that you know who you are, right? Our minds are these incredibly tricky things, right? And so you can um, trick yourself. And one of the things, I, I mean, for example, what do I mean by that? There's a lot of spiritual teachers. I just had this conversation in, an, in another podcast with somebody about um, sort of the snake oil salesman, right? The snake oil salesman. It's, you can um, convince yourself that you are something that you're not and believe that that is self-awareness. Hmm. And we see that in many different venues. And for me being in the yoga world for so long, unfortunately, I see that a lot in the yoga world. A teacher will hold themselves up as a paragon of whatever and, um, and believe that about themselves. And that leads to not taking personal responsibility for their actions in the world. You know, there's all kinds of ramifications for that. Why do I bring that up? Because I don't think it's enough to just work on your mind with your mind because of the limitations we have with our minds mm. and our beliefs and our thinking that um that can get really confused in my experience when i started to work with the energy systems that don't have a mental construct attached to them i began to have more clarity about the truth of who i was than the years of the excavational self-study that I had done in yoga or therapy, talk therapy, all of that, because of this understanding in this energy medicine work that the body never lies. The body never lies. The mind, constantly lying, right? And it lies with bad stuff too. How many of us have that mantra going on that says, you're not worthy, you're not lovable, you're not good enough, nobody likes you, like all of those little th voices in the mind, that's your mind telling you what it thinks as truths. Well, they're not truths. That's some programming. That's negative programming. Who told you that? Where have you believed that? That's not true. But if you start to work with the energy of the body, that doesn't mm. lie. And so it starts to bring you that self-awareness from the substrate of who you are, which is your energy. And the, the, I, I know that can seem kind of, well, how does that translate into my loving myself and knowing who I am and all of that? But it does translate. It's just a more of a diffuse translation. And there are some practices, especially in the energy to heal, that are all about reprogramming the unconscious mind reprogramming that negative imprinting that many of us got many of us got from our youth and from our young years before when we were just open systems 
operating systems with not a lot of programming. And then we got programmed. But did we get programmed well with the truth? Or did we get programmed with things that are continuing to, to hurt us today? Like those ideas of, you know, I'll always struggle with money. I never get what I want. Um, you know, I'll never find this X, Y, or Z. That's programming. That's in the mind. And the energy and the body are where I think the we can really overcome that and come into this honest understanding hmm. of who we are. And then, yes, it is absolutely incredibly important to to be true, to understand who you really are. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I've, I don't think I've ever really heard someone put it in that way where the mind can play tricks on us. It can lie to us, but the body never lies. Um, it makes perfect sense. I mean, I'm coming at all of this from the framework of a breathwork practitioner. And every time I get back into a breathwork practice, like let's say I take a few days off or a week off for X, Y, or Z reason, maybe I'm feel feeling ill or life gets in the way and things are just hectic and my schedule doesn't allow for it. Um, but when I come back into that practice, I can just feel alignment. I can feel healing. I can feel uh, more centeredness of, like you said earlier, that that North Star and and following it. Whereas if I'm if I'm not doing my practice, which is breath work, or for other people, it could be yoga, it could be it could be some sort of movement exercise. When you stray away from that, that to me is when the mind comes in and kind of takes over, and they. And it, uh, it, it allows maybe negative thinking to seep in or a victim mentality to seep in um, or a number of other things that the mind can do on, do on, you know, onto us. So, yeah, it's very fascinating the way you just described that. I would love to bring the idea of meditation into all of this because I know meditation is a big part of your background. And now that we're getting into this concept of mind and energy and the body. Where does meditation fall into all of this? And how can it maybe supplement the work around um, your, your type of uh, yoga practice, this EM yoga? So meditation is something that we do in every yoga class, um, towards, usually towards the end of the practice. And there are de definitely different um, meditation techniques that I draw on from different yoga schools, as well as some very specific energy medicine meditation practices. But I want to say this at the risk of outing myself. For me, meditation is the most challenging of all of the. Um, techniques in energy medicine yoga and mm. for a variety of reasons and i think that resonates with a lot of people that sitting still stilling the mind all of those things which you know at the very root meditation is that that is the the, the practice sitting still and stilling the mind and so what i've found is that there are ways to bring that meditative experience and that unifying one-pointed experience into areas of stillness within an EM yoga practice that I find brings more benefit than that sitting still. I'm not knocking traditional meditation, and it's a practice that I continue to practice all the time. But I remember I studied for years with Tom Brown Jr., um, who is a um, Gosh, how to describe him? Uh, wilderness survival, really. Um, and he studied with uh, a Native American elder, uh, and and he taught him some meditation techniques. And when I was studying with him, it was so fascinating how many overlaps there were from this Native American wisdom that he was teaching us and the yoga 
traditional yoga practice, which I had been really steeped in for years at that point. And he talked about meditation. And this might have been when I really fell in love with his teachings. Um, he said, grandfather, who is the, the, the Native American um, teacher that he studied directly with, was not a fan of sitting meditation because he was a, uh, a hunter and um, a warrior. And to sit still with his eyes closed was antithetical to how he needed to be aware of his situation. Instead, he taught a moving meditation, which is about wide angle vision and wide angle open awareness. And I started to practice that a little bit more devotedly. And what I found is that full openness to everything was also a way to have single pointedness. So there are many different meditation practices that bring you into single pointed awareness. Um, I work with and know a lot of athletes and a lot of professional athletes and being in the zone an athlete will tell you, is a meditation, being in one-pointed awareness. Doing practices, even if you're not a professional athlete, playing any kind of sport, doing any kind of activity like that, knitting, dancing, something that brings you into one-pointed awareness is a meditation. So while I do think there is value to sitting on the cushion with your eyes closed, there are also limitations to that. And one of the limitations that I do talk about in this new book is if you have had a traumatic experience in your life, any kind of trauma in your life, sitting on a cushion and closing your eyes and trying to focus on one thing, I'm not going to say is, I'm going to say can be nearly impossible for a variety of reasons. And one of them being, it's not safe for you to close your eyes and turn your attention inward and just try not to think. It's not a safe place to be. It doesn't feel comfortable. It doesn't feel good. It goes mm. back to that mental chatter of the mind that meditation is trying to still, but I personally, I am not gonna get there sitting on a cushion, closing my eyes, trying not to think about the trauma that is harassing me right now. Better to do an EM yoga practice where part of the practice is so focused on feeling this one particular point that you sink into a one-pointed focused meditation kind of without even realizing that you are. So for me, some of those practices, especially for people that are suffering from trauma or from stress that's really um, really long-term and affecting your mind in, in those kind of ways, I think can be more powerful. So I might be at odds a little bit with some traditional practices that really focus on meditation. I think, um, yeah, I think that's, yeah. that's my take on meditation. I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I do appreciate from time to time, um, you know, a traditional meditation practice like TM where you're, sitting there in silence, being still for 20 minutes. Um, for me, there's a time and place for that. But to your point, <clears throat> for some people, it might not be safe if they're going through something in the moment or still kind of working through some trauma from the past. It might not be safe for them to sit there in stillness. And I don't mean to keep bringing breath work into this, but obviously it's a big passion of mine. And there is a lot of um, connection here. Same thing with breath work. Like sometimes if, you know, for certain people that might be going through um, grief or they're still processing some sort of trauma or, or maybe they're in a state of high anxiety, it's not safe for them to sit down and do some certain types of, of breath work. So to have a blanket statement and say, you know, sitting in stillness and, and meditation is for everybody, it's just not true. Um, so I totally appreciate that that approach, yeah. and I also really appreciate the idea of taking meditation, or at least looking at it as a mindfulness practice, and applying it to something that you do enjoy, whether that's knitting, playing music, um, going for a walk. Like there are other ways to bring 
this element of mindfulness into your lifestyle. And that's kind of what I'm playing with more now. I mean, even back to breath work, like that can be a form of mindfulness. I know a lot of people say, I have a difficult time just sitting there in silence and my mind is racing and it's just too, too much. It's too hard for me to sit there and do nothing. Um, and then they try breath work and that seems to work for, for them. Um, at least when it comes to being mindful for a few moments. No, absolutely. I mean, w any practice that you can do that you can bring your full attention to, um, is, is beautiful. I mean, you know, living in the present moment, mm -hmm. even if you're planning for the future, you're in the moment planning for the future. Mm -hmm. Uh, even if you're excavating something from the past, you're in the moment. So if you can bring your attention more to the moment, that is where the richness and beauty and of life is, as well as that is the okay moment. In this moment, you are okay. Hmm. And so if you're working with a trauma and releasing the trauma, now this is different if you're actually in a traumatic moment right now, that's a different thing. And we would work with that in a different way. But if you're coming to an EM yoga practice, wanting to release your trauma, if you're coming to this EM yoga book, the energy to heal, wanting to release your trauma or our course that's coming up, you want, you bring your, your issue to the course and you want to release your trauma. The more that you're in this moment now and recognize I'm okay in this moment. Look, I'm okay enough that I bought this book, that I'm listening to this podcast, that I'm on my mat. In that moment is when you start to separate a little bit. You get a little bit of distance from this issue that has been so mm. painful for you. And that moment is really where your power is. I was just the other day, I, um, I had a bunch of things on my schedule and I wanted to do an EM yoga practice. And I thought, oh, I just, I wish I just had a little more time. I, I need this much time and I only have this much time. And I thought, okay, how do I bend time? I study Einstein. I study, you know, quantum physics. It's a possibility. How do I do it? And I realized if I could be absolutely present in every moment, that practice feels so much longer than if I'm looking at my 20 minutes and I'm looking, okay, only 20 minutes left. Oh, now I only have 15 minutes left. And I'm thinking about how little time I have. But when I just went in and I'm going to be so present in this moment, and I did that. And after about five minutes, I looked at the clock. I was like, that was only five minutes. I feel like I've been here forever. Mm. And if you remember back to when you were a kid in summer vacation, it seemed like the longest time ever. Why is that? Because you weren't like looking at the calendar and that you were outside playing or inside playing and you were in the moment. And that moment is forever because each moment is forever. Hmm. And so that is the mindfulness experience that you can really start to bend and stretch time and start to feel okay and separate yourself a little bit from the issues that have been you know, really challenging from the past. And then you do your EM yoga practice and you release all of this. I think the easiest way to think about it is the static, the static from the system. You're trying to tune into a frequency. You're trying to tune into a station. In your car, when you had the dials, if you don't have the buttons, you had the dials and you were trying to tune into the radio station. And if you don't tune directly in, you get all this static with your music. And it's like, depending on how much static it is, you might be able to listen and kind of get the song, but then it's too much static. And you're like, ugh, it's, I can't even listen to it. It's so staticky. Mm. That's you. That's you with all your stresses and all your traumas. And they're all, I'm waving my fingers around you because they're in your aura. They're in your bio field. They're also in all of these other nine systems. They're in your body. They're in that ache that's in your gut or that knee that never healed. And you're like, oh, that was just a really bad fall. Or they're in the tight muscles. They're in your headaches. All of these are the static of your issues that energy medicine yoga helps you to release, bring into coherence, bring into harmony. So all of a sudden you get your song crystal mm. clear. I love that.
And that's what you want. Yeah, that's what we would all want. Do you think that is the key to happiness is that element of mindfulness in every moment? And we might not get there fully where we're mindful in every single moment, but we can at least strive for that where you're maybe putting on your shoes and you're tying your shoes and you're so present in that moment, you're paying attention to every part of you tying that shoe or um, going for a walk and really just looking at everything around you, the trees, the birds, the whatever it may be that you see, just like being so acutely aware of that moment. When we live in that sense of mindfulness and presence, we're not worried about the past. We're not worried about what's coming in the future. We're just so focused on that present moment. Is that a key component or the key component to attaining happiness? Well, I'm going to answer that question in a little bit of a different way because I don't think the goal of life, if there is a goal, <laughs> which that's a whole other <laughs> podcast conversation, um, is happiness. I don't think the goal is happiness. And here's why. All of our emotions are in flux constantly. Our emotions are waves of energy that come through us, whether just from being, thinking, outside experiences. And so this idea that we want to be happy all the time, and there's books written about it and classes and courses and podcasts and geared towards how to have a happy life. It's kind of, um, I almost equate it with this push for women to have a specific kind of body, right? This lose 10 pounds before summer, right? This idea that if you get this, attain this thing, that you will feel this way. And that we can attain happiness and keep it forever. And that is the goal. I don't think that's the goal because what I think we want, and I think I feel like you're closer to it when you talk about this mindfulness or this presence, is to be present in our lives and open to the fluctuations of our experiences, able to feel the full gamut of our emotions able to release them when they go through so that we're not clinging to anything, mm. whether it's the happiness or it's the pain. For years, I clung to my pain. It was like, I am a painful person. I am sad and miserable. This is my story. I'll tell it to you if you want to hear it. I'll bring you into my pain bubble with me. I clung to it. So that clinging to anything is actually the root of, of our suffering because the only constant is change. And we want to be present to all of our experiences. So I want to be able to feel joy and to feel happy. And then that goes aside and what comes up next. And so to have more of an equilibrium and an openness to our experiences, something else happens. I want to be able to feel my anger. I want to feel angry. And then I want to learn why I'm angry. And what next steps I need to do? I want to release the anger. I don't want to feel angry all the time, but that anger is pointing to something that I need to mm. take action on. I need to take appropriate action grounded in compassion and love for myself and love for others. But that anger is pointing me something. The anxiety that's pointing me to something. What is going on? Is this diffuse? Is this happening in the now? Is it in the future? What am I concerned about? What do I do with that? That worry, that grief. I want to feel grief. I want to feel the agony of the loss that I have encountered in my life. I want to cry. I want to, you know, be connected for a moment with that loss. I want to feel that deeply in my soul. And then I want to let that go. So I don't want to just be happy all the time. That's like a Stepford Wives thing. I don't want that. I want to experience joy. But to... I, I don't ever want to just have one emotional component. And so I think the goal is equilibrium, is presence, is openness, is um, I, I think presence and openness and grounding, being grounded so that 
we have these points on our body. They're right here behind the ears that they're called wind points. And um, one of my favorite teachers talks about them of like the screens in the house. You want to keep them clean so that the wind can blow through and go out and not blow the house down and not blow a bunch of dust around the house. But winds have changed. Something needs to change. Let's release the old and come into the new. But you don't want to be blown over by it, but you want to be affected by it. And what did those winds tell you? What is coming up on the winds that you need to know and be aware about? But I don't think we ever just want to be one emotion or even strive for that. I don't think striving for happiness is really the goal. Hmm. Yeah, it's so, so well said. I mean, what you just described there to me is the living in the full human experience. Right, it's not about having one emotional state, whether that's happiness or grief or anxiety. Like, you want that full spectrum. You want to live life with that full human experience. And when those negative emotions do come up, it's about accepting them and looking at them as kind of signals um, from from Earth, from the universe, from our relationships from our family and our friends, like what do those emotions as signals mean, right? What can I do now to take action to just, you know, discover something new or explore this part of what's going on in my life? Well, and even, if we just strive for happiness all the time, we're not going to get that. I, I agree with you. And I apologize for interrupting. I just want to say one thing about the word that you use, these negative emotions. Because we used to use those as well, that word as well. And, um, and, and I don't use that word anymore in, in my teaching. I use challenging or difficult emotions. Because unless you're using negative in the strict yin-yang sense of negative and positive as oppositions um, of, of spatial relations, negative has so many mm. negative connotations. And there really is no negative emotion. Emotions are information. And that's not to kind of like, take the thorns off so that you know we can we don't have to talk about difficult things because these emotions are are real and they have incredibly real effects in the physical body it's not just like i have a thought i'm happy oh now that thought's gone now I have a, i'm mad now that's gone now I have a, i'm sad like that's not just what's happening you have an emotional thought and you're like i'm happy then you get dopamine surge through the body and you get anxious and then you get a cortisol surge through the body like they're connected intimately to how the physical body is run. So um, it's not, to, to say that it's negative um, is to kind of put up a barrier, like I don't wanna feel that, that's negative. It's just information. And it could be more challenging or difficult for you. Some of the emotions that are the most difficult are anger and grief. Those are two emotions that we don't um, like to spend a lot of time in. Mm -hmm. Anger specifically for women has been sort of verboten for years and grief for men has been sort of verboten. And so um, for women to be able to access their anger more and men to be able to access their grief more. But again, the, this is so we have the richness and fullness of our understanding. And so the actions that we take come out of that full expression. And with this five element practice that I offer you in the Energy to Heal, you get to experience whether consciously or embodied somatically. You can go either way. You can consciously go through this wheel of emotions or you can somatically go through it and you don't have to go back to what makes me sad, what makes me happy. You don't have to go into the story, which is really powerful, especially for people that might not have as much access to their emotional lives, that maybe have kept things at bay, um, or don't have a lot of fluency with their emotional experiences. You're still experiencing them. Your body is still filled with all of those chemicals that still need to know where to go. And so this EM yoga practice in the energy to heal is a real guide. Um, it's a method for exploring and releasing those energies in the body so that you can come into that place of balance grounded awareness. But more than that, I mean, you're talking, that's a supreme level, right? That's a, a, a high level to get to. That's 
-hmm. can be years of practice to get to that grounded, open, compassionate place all the time. For most of us right now here, we want to deal with something that's up right now. I got this thing, X, that I need to deal with and turn it into Y. I've got this pain. I've got this suffering. I've got this struggle. That's great. I love the idea of grounded, centered awareness. Mm -hmm. But right now, I am suffering from this trauma or this stress or this physical disease. And that's really where I'm putting all of my energy. And what I want you to do is take a little bit of that energy that you're using to maintain the status quo in the face of those challenges, the face of the pressure of the trauma and the stress and the disease, and put that into the system, spin the wheel, turn the wheel, do this practice, this five um, element practice, mm. and find some resolution to that event. And you spin that wheel, you've got this tool to use for your whole life. And then at some point, you may just find, wow, I kind of am living from this grounded center awareness place. It might just sneak up on you because you've released the static, all of the static from all of the signals and all of the energy systems. And that will take as long as it takes for each of us. It's different. But to me, that ongoing practice is more of the goal, right? To have that ongoing practice of releasing, of, um, of continuing. It's like, a, it's like any kind of daily grooming practice. You brush your hair every day, or you brush your teeth every day, or you sleep every day. Whatever it is that you have as part of your self-care practice. You drink your, whatever your hot drink is. We have such rituals around our hot drinks in the morning, right? What goes in it? What, you know, I'd like you to cultivate a ritual, a practice, a, um, a routine of working with your energy. And I think more than anything else you can do, that is going to bring you into these hmm. states that you want to be in. Wow. You're, uh, you're really making me think here, Lauren. I mean, there's certain things that you're saying that makes so much sense, but I just maybe haven't thought of them in that way. Um, so I really pre appreciate your approach to a lot of these topics. Are, um, are there any other areas of your new book, uh, The Energy to Heal, that we haven't maybe discussed today that you'd like to touch on? You know, I, I think one of the things that I try to really emphasize is that the work is joyful and it feels good. You know, a lot of times we think, wow, okay, if I'm going to deal with this trauma and release it, I got to set aside this big chunk of time where I don't have any other issues. This is going to be huge. It's going to be gnarly because the trauma was gnarly. I need to have space and time. <clears throat> or more than that, we think, I don't have the space and time. I can't deal with that. It's too big. I don't want to go back into the monsters. I just can't deal with it. It's, I, I just have it packed away. It's good. I'm, I'm not going to leave it packed away. But that packed away mm -hmm. is still bearing down on you and weighting you and, and keeping you really from being your full self and keeping you from healing in ways that you don't even know. <clears throat> and so what I want to say is that this work isn't gnarly. It feels good, it's enjoyable, it's easeful, and it's easy. And it really is a program that you can use again and again. I really am giving you this tool. It's called the 5E Star, and I'm giving you this program. And it's a five process program. You can do it in five weeks or five days. In the course that we uh, are starting June 7th, we're gonna take you through the entire process of the book over seven weeks because we're giving you the intro and the outro so that you really synthesize it all together. But once you have it and know how to use it, it's five experiences that you're going to put your issue into every time and it's going to come out and you're going to find this resolution. And so it's a tool that you can use for your whole life. Just like life is rich with all of its gifts, it can bring you joy and suffering. And we want to be able to learn how to work with all of our experiences. And this tool I have found to be the most powerful. And again, that's a piece I need to say. It's easy and it feels good. 
healing feels so mm. much better than suffering. I promise you, this is a beautiful experience. And I think once you try it yourself, you're going to find that. And it's a very, you know, the entry fee to trying it is pretty low. Most people who have suffered from stress and trauma have tried many different things. And I know you guys out there have done that because I had done it all too. Every modality, spending hundreds and thousands and thousands of dollars on this and that and therapy and all kinds of things. This book is $17.99. If it doesn't help you, which you will be in the 0.0001 minority if it doesn't, which granted it's possible. If it doesn't help you, you're out like three coffee drinks or two <laughs> coffee drinks, depending on how crazy your coffee order is in the morning. And if it does help you, it is the least amount of money you will ever have spent for something this profound and this powerful and this mm. game changing in your life. And I might be speaking a little hyperbolic, but it's only because I have seen this over and over and over again, the incredible results that people have experienced with this. And I am just in as much awe as anybody else the wow power of this work. I still am in awe. I cannot believe that something so simple and elegant and accessible could have this much power. So um, the hyperbole comes from experience. And I think it's actually grounded and rooted in the truth of what happens when you start to do these practices. This is what you're made of. And you are starting to communicate in the language you're made of. All of a sudden, fluency and grace are yours. Yeah. I love that. Super powerful. Um, I just can't thank you enough, Lauren, for everything that you've shared and what you have put out into the world through this book and your previous books and all of your other work. Uh, it's making a real impact for so many people. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you for having me on and sharing this. Um, where can people learn more about you and find your new book? So Everything is on our website, energymedicineyoga.net, emyoga.net. Either one of those will take you there. And um, the new book is out right now. You can get it. If you leave us a review on Amazon, you can enter to win free access to our course, which starts June 7th. If you want to join the course for sure and not just be in the entry that you might get a free entry to the course, you can join that all the way through June 5th. And then we close because this is a live course and we're really going to create this container for healing, supporting everybody. We're going to unpack the whole book and um, give you the tools that will last you a lifetime. So that's all on the website, energymedicineyoga.net, emyoga.net. You can find out everything I'm doing and all, uh, all of the events supporting the book release and the course release as well. Amazing. I love it. And I'll have that all linked up in the show notes and description as well. My last question for you, Lauren, is what does it mean to you to live a good life? Whoa. Hmm. That's a profound, uh, full question to end with. Um, <laughs> you know, I really think it goes back to what we were talking about with the emotions. I've always thought of a rich life as one that experiences a wide gamut so that you have as many experiences in your life that you want. And so for me, that's being really present with people, having relationships that are um, mutually beneficial and, and, um, and rich. And so, you know, I use the word rich instead of joyful because relationships are everything as well, right? These, these emotions, these five areas really speak to everything. So I want to have a richness in relationships, meaning we have struggle, but we get through it. We have joy and we, and we love that. We have moments of peace and quiet. And this is not just a, a love partnership relationship that I have with my husband, but with my friends, with my family, um, to be able to have these kind of relationships to be able to have experiences where I'm stretching beyond the limits, to be able to live 
quietly and peacefully and experience the richness of the world. I think one of the struggles right now, I'm sorry, I just got a tangent jumping into my head and I'm going to share it because you seem open to this kind of conversation. But I think one of the challenges that we all have being alive right now, there's so much strife. There's so much anger. There's so much trauma and stress in the world right now. And for the past, you know, three years, we have lived in this inflection point that is incredibly pressurized. And we see these blow ups happen all over the world, small and large, because of the incredible pressure that we're all under. And as a result of all of that, of of all of us globally living in that, it can feel self indulgent to have personal desires and even personal moments of joy because how can i experience joy and have this wonderful time in my life when x y and z is happening all over the world and so there there then this arises this guilt and all of this other challenging or maybe we'd say negative um ex- emotions or responses and so i think to be able to find a balance between the challenges going on in the world what can i personally do to start to mitigate those challenges for me it's bringing work out into the world that can bring us more into harmony and balance so that we stop having this overly pressurized world that we can release some of this pressure without blowing up right um but then to be able to find that balance between it's okay for me personally it's okay for you personally to desire things in your life to feel goodness in your life to feel joy to celebrate while these other really incredibly devastating things are happening we need to keep ourselves buoyant and buoyed up as well as understanding what's going on and try to mitigate that and i think that's a real balance that we're all in right now so when you say what do you think is a good life for me right now because that's all i have right now it's finding that balance that expressing the joys that i have and the griefs that i have helping however i can to bring the temperature of the world down which might be just my world and being able to celebrate and bring joy not just to me but also to the world because part of the balance is we need to bring more joy we need to bring more creativity heart centeredness openness compassion love and those come from those experiences mm. so beautiful such a nice way to wrap up our conversation and really fully encompass everything that we had talked about today with healing and yoga and what it means for our emotions and how we show up in life. Um so thank you for that answer. Thank you for joining me today and giving me your time. And uh thank you for being you. <laughs>